All right, hi. So as you may have heard, also it's really cool up here to see the fish in the background. Sorry, I'm sorry that you can't enjoy this. Um, but uh, so I'm going to talk about streams. So my handle is Pamasaur, and you can find me on the webofwar.com, also my dinosaur theme website. Um, so the thesis of the talk is that streams are the most awesome, with star emojis, data structure that you don't know enough about. And so this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about data structures. They're super cool. You're going to be so excited. You're going to be like, oh, I can't even believe this. Um, so actually, I forgot to bring something up with me. Could I ask someone from this cool table over here to bring me? There's cups on the table, uh, like a stack of four cups. And then my backpack has a water bottle. Can you bring it? There's going to be a real life demo soon. And I, you know, I'm stressed. And so I forgot to bring up all my props. Um, oh, thank you. So thank you. Yes. All right. Um, oh, and is this your water bottle? <laughs> cool. Just trading water bottles, standard stuff. Uh, so OK, great. So we should be good to go. All right, so we're going to talk about streams. Streams, so I'll talk to you about what they are and then why you're going to be excited about them. Talking about what streams look like in JavaScript, so relevant to all of us here, and then libraries and emerging standards. So of course, streams are awesome, but then how do you actually use them? So streams, streams. <laughs> streams? <laughs> streams. So I, when I was researching this, I went on this, this journey into let's talk, learn about the history of streams. And the first instance I can understand of the, where the streams data structure comes from is from Unix. So that's pretty cool. So if you use Unix and you use your terminal or command line, your preferred you know, uh, shell of choice, you've probably used a pipe. So it's all about the pipe operator. The pipe operator looks like this. It's that little skinny line in between the two commands. So what it looks like, and this is so great that we're at a zoo, so the best animals. So cat uh, grabs and concatenates out to the terminal. So it does that. And then I can pipe grep dash i for case insensitive for all instances of cats, because the internet is ruled by cats. Everyone knows this. Um, so, so we use that pipe operator. And what's happening is we're taking the output of the first command. And what the pipe does is it says, I want you to take that output and send it to this next command. And so you might have used this. You might not even know that it's called a pipe, but you're doing stream operations when you do that. So what are streams, though? So we say that, so streams are an abstract data structure, meaning that it won't always be called a stream, but it will be stream-like, and it comes in different flavors. So abstract data structures are hard to get your head around because it's not, in a language, there won't always be a thing called a stream, but you can use data like it is a stream. So a real-world demo. So I'm going to step away from my computer <laughs> to do this demo. Um, and actually, uh, Christian, can I ask you to be my assistant? So, so we're going to do, thank you. So, so hold this. So we have, we have a really tough problem right now. So we need to take some water that I'm not going to spill on my computer. Um, and we're going to take it from this first cup, and it needs to get into this cup. But because reasons, it has to go into this cup in between. So putting the lid on the water so it doesn't get on my computer. Um, all about safety. All right, so here's one way to do it. Yeah, I'm a little short. So ta-da, yay, that was really cool, right? Yeah. OK, so let's, let's swap. So we'll change out. Da, da, da. So let's change this out for a new and improved model. Oh my god, that was so much faster. <laughs> that is a, a real world demo. Thank you very much. Um, you, you can keep that. You can keep that for you. Thanks. <laughs> so it's a little we don't we don't do enough, you know, I think that's fun like science class stuff of let's do a real experiment. And so this is how that's how streams work. So instead of so that second cup is kind of like memory. So instead of pouring that into memory and mutating it and then pouring it into the third cup, we just send the output right on through. And so that's what's happening. 
Oh, okay. Lights. All right. So, SICP. <laughs> so, the Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs is a book that if you have a degree in computer science, you may have read. And if you have a degree in computer science and you haven't read it, you probably feel guilty about it. Uh, so, but what SICP says, which is kind of a, it's a, a great reference on computing and how it is done, is that streams are a delayed list. So it's like a list structure, but you don't have all the values, you know, at, at once. So you don't have them right away. So why streams? So streams, you want to use them because you can't or don't want to hold everything in memory. So we don't always want to... We can't sometimes, or we don't want to hold things in memory. So if we use large data sets, so you don't want to hold it in memory. Bandwidth is expensive. So this is still true. So these are things. So if we use streams, we can cut down on our use of bandwidth. Streams, and why you should be excited by them. So streams can represent possibly infinite data. So this is really cool because it's infinite data. And if you use infinite data, you are basically a wizard. And that's really cool, and you should be super excited about streams. So what are some things that don't have an end? You're like, infinite data, everything has an end. Not true. So we've got natural numbers. There's no such thing as an end in natural numbers, because you can always create a new natural number by adding one to whatever number you have. Infinite data. Weather doesn't end. Uh, user input, such as keystrokes, that's relevant to us, right? Uh, or mouse clicks, or you know, all of this. These are events that don't necessarily have an end. And large data sets or your heartbeat, these are the star next to them because they do have an end, you just don't know when it is. Uh, so you operate under the assumption that it's going to keep going. And so when we program like this, it changes the way we think about our data. So why I mentioned SICP is I don't really like using quotes and talks, but this is, was so awesome that I wanted to put it in here, that stream processing lets us model systems that have state without using assignment or mutable data. That is really awesome. So we're going to see it again. <laughs> so if you can model state, which generally takes time, takes memory, and you don't have to use assignment, so you don't have to use memory, or mutable data, you get to go a lot faster. It's really cool. So I did mention that streams are an abstract data structure, and so they come in multiple flavors. And the two general flavors that streams come in are push and pull modes. So a push stream is like a fire hose. So you'll see a lot of the different vocab used for streams. You'll see producer, consumer, source, con uh, source, consumer, uh, spoilers, um, uh, of the observed and the observer. Uh, so a push stream is, so this is where the source sends its data down to the receiver. So the symptoms of that you might, you might, might be using a push stream, if you see this, this will sound familiar, callbacks, non-blocking systems. So the source just throws data at the consumer. And so the downside, so everything has a downside, the downside is if your consumer can get overloaded. So if your consumer can get overloaded, such as you have like a multi-threaded system, and then it's you know is going to fall over if it can't handle or it doesn't have some kind of way of handling a push stream. So that's the downside of push streams. The pull stream is if you say the source sits there, kind of like a lake of data, and so but and when you need more water, you get your bucket and you walk to the lake and you get more water, and then you walk back and you have more water. Ta-da! And you go back and get more when you need more. So the symptoms of using a pull stream are you see them with iterators. They'll be blocking, because if you're carrying the bucket of water, you can't do anything else. Uh, and that the downside is, you know, well, the downside is you need to time out. And I just really like this is one of my favorite little catchphrases in computing is if you have a timeout, you should never, ever block forever. Uh, so it's very catchy. And so because blocking, you can't, you don't want to stop the world forever. We know this. So that's what happens with pull streams. So streams in JavaScript. So what do, what do they look like? So node streams are push streams. So if you saw the, the callbacks, non-blocking, that might have sounded really familiar. And so we see these in node. So the classic example, so Substack has a lot of great resources on streams. So this is the, the simple server that reads a file and then sends it out. Here's the important part. So the file system reads the file, so gets data.txt, and then 
when it is done reading the file, so after it's completely done, it sends that data to the response. So what it's doing is it's reading all of that into memory, and then it sends it to the response. Here's the way to do that with streams. So there's the, the server, and here is the important part. The spacing is a little off so I can make it bigger. So we create a readable stream. Node's great too since it, I like that it uses the stream language, so it's a really great way to learn about the static structure. And so you read into the stream, and then remember how we talked about Unix? Literally it uses the word pipe. So that's the keyword in Node to pipe from a stream to, a, to an output, so to a, to a goal. So, so we pipe to the response, everything goes faster, really cool stuff. So we're piping rather than using memory. Go node streams, they're great. So generators, so they are the cool, a cool thing in ES6. We haven't really had something like them in JavaScript before. The definition of them would be that they're reusable and pausable functions, or are they whole streams? <laughs> So, because the way a generator works is that you can create a generator. So you can create an instance of this reusable function, reusable and possible function, also known as blocking. And so you can ask for more from the generator when you want more. You call the next function or keyword, however you want to call it, and then you get the next value from the generator. Symptoms of knowing that you're using a generator. So I'm gonna do a little intro to generators here. So the symptoms of you know you're using a generator when you see a function and a star and the yield keyword. So a little example, super example of function something yields two. So here's it creating an instance of something and then you call s.next to get it. So some generators demos, so a little bit more. And I think I have to refresh this. Generate. All right. Everything is such big text. Cool. All right. So we console log something, something else, something else entirely. And so what that looks like, these are, are pretty trivial examples for generators. But so this, my generator, we console log something. So when we first call next, what happens is up to this gets executed. And so what I have in, in the trivial example is it's changing the, it's mutating the page to say to, I'm actually passing this so that I can show the done in the, the done keyword or value in the browser. But so when we call it the first time, we get that, call it the next time, we get that. And then the last time we call it, there's no more yields, but there is still, more to be run. So what's gonna happen is your generator on its terminal call executes whatever is left, which is actually pretty great when you think about it for cleanup functions and things like that that need to happen when you're done consuming a data source, which is a pretty common use case when we think about it. So let's, let's do it again just for the sake of, so now that we've looked at the JavaScript, find the button, so generate something, so that's our first call, our second call, and now we're done. So we went through each of the yields. So we had our, our silly little data source and we consumed it and now we're done. And if I keep going, it's done. Like it's done forever, it is read once. It's a reusable function, but once we create an instance and we use it, it's done. That is, it actually makes it, it kind of makes sense when you think about it as a stream-like interface. So that what, like once it is you know, in the terminal cup <laughs> of water, it's already there. It can't be anywhere else. I mean, unless you do something with the water, I don't know, whatever. Um, so let's switch to the, the other trivial example that has a little bit more. And so switching the generator front to string breaker. And so, and I do have, these slides are on the internet so you can mess with all this and you know, if it helps you learn stuff. So commenting out, because I put them all in the same thing. So let's see if I did that right. Yeah, so John went to the store and said, hey there, to the clerk. So what this reusable and possible function does, also known as a generator, is it consumes a string. So when you call, when you call the next, it consumes a string and it goes through each character in the string and says, you know, do we have a word? And then if we have a word, we're gonna print it out, but if we're in quotes, we wanna represent that as one, 
one piece of data because reasons. And so, so in this, so it's a little, it's a, a generator that has an accumulator, and so for character of, which is also, I really like for of, it's a nice ES6 thing. Uh, so if character equals this, and we're not in a quote, then yield the accumulated value. So, and then reset the accumulated to an empty string. So, if I can, so now that you know what that is doing, do the, ah. And then furthermore, that for of, we could do that, say we want, say we have a data source and we want to just iterate through the data source, you can use for of to walk through generators. So, pretty cool. I really like that of keyword, it's something that's so useful. So that is your intro to streams. If I can get back. So can you use ish? So that generators example, I'm running in Chrome and you know, so in modern browsers, you can use generators. <laughs> um, but ish, so you wanna use Babel.js and that, you know, the Kangx, you know, use of where you can use things and the other can I use stuff is always very useful for figuring out if you can have nice things. So, generators are really cool. I hope you can, can find ways to use them. So step three, so some libraries and emerging standards. So libraries for working with streams. So there's three ones that I wanted to highlight, just a just brief touch on them. So BaconJS, HighlandJS, RxJX. So here's BaconJS, it's like underscore for events. I cut out the scary parts, and if you don't get that joke is I cut out anything that says functional reactive programming. Um, so, it gives you, BaconJS is a really nice, just if you wanna just get started and mess around with it, it is a really clear, easy interface, like underscore, so it gives you functional operations on streams, so on events, so which, remember, events are just streams. So we can think about that. Meanwhile, Highland, uh, which is the first one of these that I ended up using, is I added the emphasis on the stream constructor. I really like that it uses the word stream, it helps you conceptualize it really well. Uh, and it accepts an array of values or a generator as an optional argument. I really like it because it gives you that single interface for many different data types. So some of you might not like it for this reason, I like it for this reason, but you can hand different kinds of data to it and interact with it in the same way. So it's very friendly to node streams, friendly to generators, arrays, events, promises. You can use all these different kinds of data in Highland and do functional operations on them, such as functional operations referring to map, filter, things like that. RxJS, so ReactiveJS. Reactive tools, stream friendly, batteries included. RxJS, as it is right now, is pretty scary to get started with. <laughs> um, but the next RX Next, uh, RxJS Next, is being worked on and will hopefully make it a lot easier to get started. But it really is, if you, you know, if you're intrigued by this reactive programming thing, then RxJS is probably the end game you're gonna get to. So if you're thinking, hold on, is this talk a Trojan horse for reactive programming? You aren't wrong. <laughs> Congratulations. So if reactive programming is, you know, this cool idea or functional programming, you know, all these terms get thrown around, they're really interesting to you, but you have no idea, and you can't talk about them on Twitter because someone's, you know, gonna hop out of a corner and say, that's not FRP, and then you have to, you know, have a Twitter fight, and it's really complicated. Um, so this video helps a lot. So this is Evan who wrote the, who created the Elm language, which is a really cool language. And he gave this talk at Strange Loop that covers the different flavors of FRP. And really in JavaScript, we kind of only get one flavor and it's not FRP, spoiler. Um, so it's definitely not first order FRP. Um, but it's his talk was really the best example I've seen of explaining these concepts in an understandable way. And since it's so hard to, you know, the, the joke about, say, for example, learning monads is, you know you've learned monads if you are unable to explain monads. So like, once you've learned it, you are completely unable to explain it. Um, so, a little bit like that, so I really recommend that video. Uh, also recommend, uh, Stoltz has this intro to Rx. Uh, the title's longer than that, but again, these slides are online, so you can go grab the, the link, and it's, this, all those examples are in Rx.js, so it really helps you with how to take, take your concepts from a, you know, a listener's model to a thinking of things in streams model. 
So some emerging standards, always fun. So we've got a browser stream standard. How cool is that? So it's literally called streams. Uh, there's people from the Node team working on this. Um, like all standards, who knows if, we'll, if when it'll happen, but uh, really interesting. And the browser stream standards is especially interesting when you look at the Fetch API. So this is really exciting. So the Fetch API, which like you should all stand up and you know clap for, is going to prevent you from having to include jQuery just because you don't want to write an X ML HTTP request and you just want to write $.ajax. So the Fetch API is going to give you that kind of interface. Uh, it's really, really cool. Um, so I highly recommend just using, I, you know, I did a thing using the polyphone. It's really nice to use. So we fetch some data and then, so this feels really familiar from using other libraries, uh, function response. And so for example, in this, at the first, the first pass, so the first transformation, you know, term my response into JSON, really common thing. So eventually, what the Fitch API, the plan, is that it will consume streams. So this is not true yet. So even, so the Fetch API exists in some browsers. So we don't, but we don't have streams in browsers. So when we have streams, what you should be able to do, my dream, the joy of my heart, is that you will be able to consume the data and instead of waiting for the whole thing to come back, Think about how cool this is for data visualization. This is one I'm really excited by. Consuming huge data sets without having to paginate. So we can process the data and then pass it to the next processing phases as it goes through each step. That's what we can do with streams and it's really exciting. Object.observe. So this is, when I started thinking about it, I was like, this is a stream interface too. You start seeing streams everywhere, they're everywhere. And so if you think about it, we have an object and we set up, you know, set up say, hey, you know, when you change, I wanna know about it. So we have a consumer. So it's a stream of events, like it's a stream of data. So the trivial example is we have an object and then we watch the object and do something with this changes. So the observable type is another one that's really exciting. And this is also honestly a great reason to get using, if you've been using some of the other reactive libraries, to think about using RxJS if you aren't already, uh, because it has this observable type, which the plan you know, is to be a native type in JavaScript as of next year. So in ES7, which you know, we, one day we'll have nice things. Um, but you can have nice things today by using RxJS. So you can create an observable, so this of keyword creates, so you pass it the data, it creates an observable, and then do those functional operations on it. Map, filter, for each, and then a final then do something. So some small projects using each of these tools. So there are, some of them are a little trivial, but it's mostly a fun way to show that, hey, here's what these things like look not you know, in a not theoretical sense. So let's find out, is my internet up? Is the internet up? Yeah, did you all see that? Did you see how it kind of snapped? So it went from, so it's, it's, it won't do it as fast, it, won't, it will do it faster on the second pass, but it doesn't load, you know, like a web page sometimes all at once, it's actually taking, so what last week blog, a simple example, is it has a config, so you can put all your friend's blog in a YAML file uh, with their RSS feeds, and then it'll tell you, hey, here's a post from last week. I put New York Times in here just so I could have a, a decent amount of data, because sadly, my friends aren't blogging enough. Um, so, so I put that in so that we could actually see it fill out. And so as it, so it goes, so using Highland, it goes and gets uh, so what happens, we get the source for these, go get the RSS feeds, transform those into data, filter them for the posts that are from last week, and then feed that into the browser. So we're using streams and reactive tools to send the data as it's ready. So we get a faster response. So space time app, it uses the Fetch API. I'm sad that we don't have streams with the Fetch API. The story behind this is so space time app. Uh, so this is a visual data visualization. So remember, I'm super excited about streams of data visualization. So you have a DeLorean, and you have these are stars plotted in 3JS, and so we have the plane of stars, and we can see how the stars change over time. So given a certain like stars have a certain velocity that they're moving through space, and 
we worked with literally an astrophysicist to write this. <laughs> so it's really cool. Um, because it's really it's interesting if you think about that when we had, when we, you know, people long before us created the zodiac, the stars actually look different. And so it's really interesting. Um, so you can drive your DeLorean and it's, it's, you know, it's pretty good plus or minus 10,000 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, uh, once you get over here, it's not actually accurate. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. So I, I used the Fetch API and refactored this a couple months ago, uh, and I got the problem. The thing that I was so excited about streams is I refactored uh, without doing enough control tests. So I used the stream. I went from 3,000 stars to 100,000 stars, and I was like, "Oh my God, I'm using streams!" But really, the browser had just gotten better since the last six months ago when I last worked on it, and it because it used to fall over it at you know, you know 100,000 stars, and now it doesn't. So cool. Um, but yeah, so it uses the Fetch API, and so you can look at the project and see it actually being used. So and it's, it's called Constellation Deformation on GitHub under Hack the Universe. So millennials to snake people. <laughs> so this uses object.observe um, to observe mutations to the DOM. And so this is a new update. Uh, millennials to snake people is by Eric Bailey, who wrote the original Chrome extension. I wrote the Firefox add-on, so now you can get it in Firefox. And somebody else wrote the, the Safari. Um, so it, uh, up until this week, it just did it on page load. But you know, a lot of websites, such as Facebook, you know, mutate the DOM. And so we use object.observe to watch for mutations to the DOM and update, appropriately update mentions of snake, uh, millenni sorry, millennials <laughs> to snake people. Um, so dear snake people, we're sorry. <laughs> um, or if there's a lot of, so generation me changes to the cult of the serpent. Um, and then my personal favorite is millennial children are called snakelets. Uh, so, yeah, so, uh, so it's available on Chrome, now Firefox, and the Firefox I just updated yesterday, I believe it was approved uh, preliminarily. So you can, you can now read Facebook and have all mentions of millennials replaced by appropriate snake-related words. <laughs> so. so, and the, the thing that it's doing, so let's look at the, uh, the code open. So it's a really short little, so walk and observe. So we, so when this, when this content script is loaded in your browser, it walks the document, and then it also sets up observers. So it says, we're gonna create a new mutation observer. So down there, so, and then when, when we mutate, we have an observer callback, and it does, spoiler, it does the, you know, snake people replacement. Uh, and so setting up body.observer.observe. Like it's really short, but it has this really fun effect of, when we see mutations, we change things. It's a, it is a, you know, a push stream. When we have new data, we do things about it. So example of this is a little trivial, but I wanted to make an uh, example. So silly art using the, I call it silly art, it's not even, I don't know. I'm, well, there's no rules for what you can call art, so it's art, let's call it art. Okay, so we're gonna click to move the circle. Ta-da! Yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so what it's doing is the, so I have RxJS, and when you click, so it helps if I scroll down there. So we're plotting, we're moving the circle around, and we're plotting it where you clicked. So it's, the observable is looking at your clicks, and then we get data back from it, and then we use that data to move the circle around. So that is a simple example of using observables. But if you think about it, you can think of all these things you can do with observable types. So some interesting links, just to wrap it up a little. So node streams, I did mention that Substack had these great resources, so streams handbook, stream adventure is in the node school uh, package of family of things. Node streams, also conveniently titled and easy to remember uh, to go learn about node streams. Generators, one of my favorite things, and uh, so Kyle Simpson, also known as Getify, has great stuff on generators. Uh, he has this, I really like this router example he put up on tw Twitter a while ago that is, is a nice example of, you know, oh, especially I think it's when we get these new constructs and it's, it's hard to see how we might actually use them. And so I like the router example because, hey, like, we create routers pretty often. <laughs> so I like this example of, hey, here's how we could create a reusable function reusable and consumable function, uh, and here's what it actually looks like. Uh, you Don't Know JS has a great chapter on generators, and Axel Rosh Meyer's 
ES6 generators in DEF is really great. And in general, Axo always has fantastic resources on what else is coming out in JavaScript. So highly recommended. So there's reactive programming libraries, BaconJS, Highland, and RxJS. And the slides are at pcelli.github.io slash OMG streams. So hopefully you can remember OMG streams. I'll, I'll tweet about it in case too, um, so you don't have to remember my GitHub handle. So thank you very much. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Pamasaur. My blog is The Webivore. And if you listen to podcasts, I have a podcast people called Turing Incomplete. And if you think that joke is funny, then you're going to like the podcast. <laughs> so, uh, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed learning about streams. <laughs>